Thank you very much for having me. Um, it is my pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, some of the work uh, that, that I and a number of other people have been doing over many years uh, with, with phenotypes uh, and related software tools uh, for primarily for doctors and researchers who are interested in, in solving uh, genetic, uh, oftentimes rare and undiagnosed genetic diseases uh, for their patients or participants in research projects. Ooh, that went quickly. So the first thing that I wanted to start with, um, thank you for giving everyone a bit of an introduction into the HPO and things like that. That will make this easier. Um, so the the core of why we are doing what we are doing is that having data that is structured and computable uh, is incredibly powerful. And we can use that power to help diagnose patients better. Um, this comes in in various tools, including PubCase Finder, where having that structured data allows you to identify relationships between the patient's symptoms and, and genes or diagnoses that are you know, of, of interest or likely to cause a patient's condition. And there are you know, a, a number of tools that use different approaches to solve this problem, um, and they are very, very powerful in their ability to find things that, that clinicians might not uh, be able to identify because there are so many different diseases and so many different genes and so much information that is coming out on an ongoing basis. Uh, having structured data also allows us to share information globally. If the information is on paper or even in textual notes, those do not necessarily translate well into other languages. But when we have ontologies like the human phenotype ontology, then you can translate that one time and then all of the data that you represent uh, using those ontologies then can be communicated uh, and used across different uh, language areas around the world. Um, and lastly, when you have this data structured, it makes other sorts of, of computation much easier as well, such as finding other patients uh, that are similar from a large database of patients. Um, you can, you can, this is what is happening over things like the Matchmaker Exchange and in platforms like Phenome Central, where if you have an undiagnosed patient, you want to ask the question, who is similar to this patient? And that's a very hard question to answer if all you have is text, and a much easier question to answer if you have data in structured formats. So that is the power of, of structured data. Why isn't everything structured data? And the answer is that it is oftentimes difficult to collect data in that format or get it into that format, right? In one form, you might have you know, paper representations of patient charts. Um, more structured forms are when you get into having questionnaires. This is incredibly common. Um, but you, in addition to, you know, you, you ask very specific questions at a very particular level of granularity, but then you always need to ask about other things. And then you end up with this unstructured, open-ended text again. And one of the things that we found in a collaboration uh, that started the Phenotips project a long time ago was that as soon as you ask for this unstructured textual information about a patient's uh, presentation, the, there is considerable uh, variability in the way that the same concept might be represented. Uh, lots of different ways of writing the same thing and lots and lots of abbreviations and even things that when you when you ask genetic counselors or clinicians afterwards what they meant by this, it isn't necessarily clear or unambiguous. Uh, so this is sort of the state of the world uh, for phenotypic information, and we wanted to improve it. So this is where the human phenotype ontology comes in uh, as a, a tool for structuring uh, the patient's clinical presentation in a way that is computable. So you've heard these numbers and this introduction already from, from Fujiwara-san. Um, and the question that we asked is, rather than assuming that everyone will start using these technologies, uh, how can we build tools to make it easy 
or easier for doctors and researchers to collect data in this format. So this is where phenotypes came from. Phenotypes uh, was started in two, 2012. Uh, so it's now about six years old. Um, it is an open source software tool that you can download and run on a computer, um, on a laptop even, and use it to record patient information, track those patients, and collect structured uh, phenotypic and genotypic information about that patient for the purposes of, of diagnosing them or, or tracking them for a study. Um, it, there are a number of features that we've tried to build into this software to make it easy to use for the doctors and researchers that have to do this process, um, trying to make it be better than paper in a lot of ways um, in terms of the way that the description uh, the way that the terms can be selected from the human phenotype ontology. We have tried to make a search tool that is uh, predictive, so you don't have to write the whole word in order to find it, and tolerant to typos, as well as including common acronyms and things like that that a doctor might want to use. When the, the relevant terms appear, you can either uh, say that a particular term was identified in a patient, or you can say that it was identified as a, it was, it was absent, and the fact that it is absent is important to record. It has measurements built in, so very commonly in genetics, uh, there are a number of measurements that are, that are frequently captured, height, uh, weight and head circumference are three examples. Uh, so we have the ability to record measurements over time and chart those measurements on growth curves, uh, standard growth curves. If those measurements are sufficiently abnormal, we automatically add the corresponding HPO terms for those quantified abnormalities uh, so that then this can be used and interpreted uh, along with all of the other, uh, other algorithms, using the other algorithms. We also have, uh, if there is, for some patients, you might have existing text uh, that for that patient's clinical description, either previous notes or a ref uh, referral to genetics. Uh, and in those cases, we take those and suggest uh, the HPO terms from this text. The approach that we take is to still do this as suggestions. So these are not automatically added to the patient record. We think that the quality of these algorithms is not enough yet that you want to add all of those to the patient form. You want to still have the expert to review them before adding them. And the reason is that Oftentimes, clinic notes will describe uh, pertinent negatives, so terms that are, you know, uh, conditions that are not present in the patient. You don't want those to be added, and text uh, tools are not very good at telling that, as well as it is very common to describe conditions in relatives, uh, and text analysis tools are not very good at telling whether it is talking about the patient themselves or a family member. Once we have the patient's, uh, once the clinician or researcher has recorded the patient's uh, phenotype using HPO terms, there are a lot of analyses that we can perform and do perform uh, automatically and, and in real time, such as suggesting diagnoses uh, from OMIM, similar to the, the approach used by uh, PubCase Finder, um, and that is where we are hoping to plug in PubCase Finder at uh, Biohackathon, uh, as well as suggesting uh, relevant genes that are known to be associated with the patient's uh, symptoms. We also have built uh, within Phenotips a pedigree drawing tool to collect the family history. This is something very often used in genetics to record all of the family members, what conditions they have, um, and how they are related to the patient. And then in, for cancer, it is very important to estimate the risk 
of each person in that family uh, for having uh, a carrier mutation. Uh, and so we can then, because this information is now being collected electronically, we can communicate with risk assessment tools uh, in order to include those risk scores uh, in line in the pedigree. We also have built for for research groups that are doing novel gene discovery, the ability to analyze exome and genome results, so the annotated uh, variant level data, right within the patient form, so that they can use the phenotype that they've described for that patient uh, to see associated genes and then immediately filter the variants by those genes. So this is just one more filter that the genetic counselor would have in addition to the other filters like the allele frequency in a particular database or a harmfulness assessment score, things like that. They have the ability of incorporating phenotypic information right into that filtering process to zero in on the, likely, the most likely uh, variants to cause the patient's condition. Uh, phenotypes itself is internationalized, uh, in, and I presented this slide last year, unfortunately. <laughs> I got to copy it over because we haven't finished, uh, but we are still working uh, on the Japanese translation, um, and that is one of the things that I'm hoping to, to make progress towards while I am here. Um, but it is, it is translated into different languages, uh, specifically those languages that the human phenotype ontology itself is already translated into, so that then you can get the full benefit um, of using the translated ontology within a translated user interface. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the different places uh, that phenotypes is used around the world and the different ways that it is used uh, at those sites. So this is one uh, overview to orient uh, everyone in terms of the different sorts of things that I'll be talking about next, uh, in terms of the different parts of the, the patient and diagnosis ecosystem uh, for, for healthcare. So uh, phenotypes is used at hospitals, uh, integrated into the electronic health record systems frequently. Um, it is also used at standalone research clinics, and there's the ability to communicate records between these two. Oftentimes a hospital will also have a research study uh, there, and so it is frequently useful to have patients be seen clinically uh, in genetics, and then if they are not diagnosed uh, based on sort of known genes, to have the, those patients consent to a research study and that record be de-identified and sent over to a research uh, database uh, that is also at that institution. So that is something that is common. Um, or to connect to a national or international initiative, which often have their, their de-identified uh, data repositories and databases, and either the hospitals send data directly there and de-identify it in the process, or they will send uh, patient records, these de already de-identified research patient records from those individual research clinics, like the Undiagnosed Disease Program, to broader national or international initiatives like the Undiagnosed Disease Network or the Undiagnosed Disease Network International. From there, it is common for uh, either these, these sites to have or to connect to uh, matchmaking portals for cases that still remain undiagnosed uh, so that you can identify other uh, clinicians or other cases that are likely to cause the same condition and, and discover novel novel disease genes. Um, so there, there is a platform called Phenome Central that is built on top of phenotypes. It is one of the nodes within the matchmaker exchange, um, which is this network for, for, uh, for solving that problem. So in all, there are around over 4,000 clinicians and researchers that use phenotypes, uh, and there are over 130,000 patient records that are currently recorded around the world in phenotypes. So we have uh, made 
a large contribution towards the structuring of patient phenotypic information um, in, in the rare disease and, and genomic uh, disease space. Uh, there are over 100 open source instances of the software that we're aware of. So the software is freely available to download and run. Um, and then the, the hospital comes in when, uh, sorry, the company comes in when the, the phenotypes is licensed to be integrated into health record systems um, and larger institutions. So there we have uh, soft, there is software for sort of general medicine. Uh, the two largest uh, suppliers for electronic health records around the world are Epic and Cerner. Um, and then Phenotips fits in as the, the software that is focused on genomics and the genomics workflow for geneticists, for genetic counselors, um, oftentimes for other specialties like cardiology, neurology, or nephrology that do see a lot of genetic diseases and need to be able to describe their patient's phenotype in order to refer to genetics or analyze the patient's genetics. And so we make sure that there is a connection between the electronic health records and the genomics workflow at these institutions. This includes actually embedding phenotypes directly within the electronic health record system visually. From the, so behind the scenes, they, they are two separate systems that are talking over APIs. But from the perspective of the clinician, they appear to be one tool so they don't have to leave their electronic health record system in order to describe the work, do uh, fill out the phenotypes record for the patient, um, record the human phenotype ontology terms um, for the patient and draw the pedigree. They can do that right within the, the health record system. So the ways that this are set up is that there is either one or two-way data sharing between these two systems. So the electronic health record system is usually the source of truth for patient demographics, like their name, identifiers, birthday, and measurements. Um, depending on where this is set up, uh, either the health record or phenotypes will be the ground truth for the patient's problem list um, and their ultimate diagnoses. Um, it, so there's the ability to have information be entered in one of the two and transferred into the other one. And then phenotypes is used to generate usually a report for the patient uh, that includes all of the phenotype and the pedigree, um, but also often the pedigree explicitly. So a lot of health record systems do not do a good job of recording families. The concept of families is not something that is often within a health record system because each patient is seen separately and there is potential privacy uh, concerns around having the uh, information linking patients together. So they actually do explicitly try not to record families, but that is something for clear reasons that is very important from, for genetics. And so phenotypes is often used as the, the record for the way that different people are related to each other in that family structure, which includes the visual pe pedigree representation. So as I alluded to earlier, um, Phenotips has the functionality to send uh, cases to other databases. So there is, it is called the ability to push cases from one database to another. So they still exist on the original database, but it sends a, a copy to the other database that can be overwritten if, if the source changes, and you get full control over which information to send. Um, this is, the, the set of options is restricted by which information the receiving database can re is configured to receive. So this allows us to set up research databases that will not store or accept uh, identifiable information like the patient's name, um, but still gives the original user control over other information that they would like to send, such as whether or not to include medical history or whether or not to include genetics. 
So I wanted to talk about a few of these real world examples where we have this set up um, to talk in a little bit more detail. So to start with, uh, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network in the US uh, is a collection of now 13 sites. They just grew um, from the previous, I think five was, or six was how many they were before. They are now up to 13. Um, some of these sites use phenotypes, not all of them. But they have a coordinating center, which is in Boston, which does use phenotypes. And so as a result, those sites that also use phenotypes um, or even other tools that support that API can push those cases uh, directly to the coordinating center so they can record more information locally as part of their clinical or as part of their local workflow and then send the information that the coordinating center needs to that instance and then they can manage it at uh, the level of the entire undiagnosed diseases network there. So this, the, this uh, different approach is used by the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International. So this is the, the organization, the umbrella organization or consortium around all of the undiagnosed disease, uh, undiagnosed disease pro national undiagnosed disease programs around the world. Um, they use Phenome Central, uh, which is this a matchmaking portal built on top of phenotypes uh, as their matchmaking site for those undiagnosed patients. Um, the, there is a requirement that in order to be a member for the Undiagnosed Disease Network International, you must submit a minimum number of cases um, each year to this matching portal. And for those sites that do use another software locally, so they could either enter those cases directly into Phenome Central or through uh, other software tools like Phenotips or Patient Archive, they can use those tools uh, at, in their country and then push uh, the, the de-identified patients to the matchmaking portal. So this functionality uh, is very useful for setting up these hierarchical organizations and consortia that have to manage data sharing at multiple levels and de-identifying data in that process. Within Phenome Central, um, there are additional, it is, it is built on top of phenotypes with additional functionality focused on finding similar cases within the database. Um, so for example, if you've described your patient's phenotype and added and any genes that might be of interest, you can immediately see within uh, the, the patient form other cases in that database that are similar based on uh, a relevant score. So they're ordered by a relevant score and you can actually expand and view what is similar um, in terms of the phenotype and genetics uh, for those two patients and potentially contact the owner of that other record. So this is, I wanted to take one moment to just to show people how the human phenotype ontology can make this process of finding similar patients very easy. Um, so if we have two patients, uh, a very simple, very effective approach for telling or calculating how similar two patients' clinical presentations are, is we can take, this is just a, a illustration of the human phenotype ontology because it is this uh, uh, graph structure where more general terms are up at the top. So there is a single, uh, what we would call a root node, which is the patient has something wrong with them, phenotypic abnormality. And then the children of it are sort of high level anatomical systems. The patient has something wrong with uh, their neurological system or something wrong with their cardiovascular system. And then each of those get into more and more detail. What we usually, when you are describing a patient, the clinician would describe, you know, the patient has syndactyly of their right hand and the patient has an eye abnormality and the patient maybe has some neurological abnormality. So we have these individual terms down here, these leaves or internal nodes that the clinician has recorded. And we can look up the tree for all of those terms that are implied for both patients and actually use the, inter the 
relative sizes of the intersection between this set and this set and the union of those two sets as a very, very simple uh, score uh, that is incredibly effective as a first pass for this sort of thing. And that is a much more effective, simple approach than you can do with anything like having textual representations of these patients' phenotypic descriptions. Uh, we see in practice that this works quite well. So this is from early, early on. Uh, our collaborators uh, in Ottawa, there was a project called Forge uh, Canada, and there there were a number of patients that they had described using HPO, and we saw that these sorts of very simple uh, scoring systems based on those phenotypic representations cluster patients with the same condition very, very nicely together. Uh, within Phenome Central, there is also the ability to identify matches in other databases within the matchmaker exchange. Uh, so that is shown in a very similar form. So for instance, for Decipher, you can see a disclaimer. You can refresh matches in case they've changed. And then it shows you for each of those matches what the score is how to contact uh, the owner of that other case or find out more information about that case and what is similar between your patient and the other patient in terms of phenotype, uh, age of onset, mode of inheritance, and candidate genes. That is the contact. So as part of the matchmaker exchange, uh, so Phenome Central is up here um, and, and IRUD is now an official member, and uh, the DBCLS, this being PubCase Finder, I think, uh, I, for the uh, connected knowledge source that, match, that communicates over the Matchmaker Exchange API for those Matchmaker Exchange nodes that want to be able to query those systems within the same uh, ecosystem or the same user interfaces. Um, so this data is a little bit out of date. I don't have up-to-date numbers for it, um, but as of, I think, uh, mid-last year, we were at 16 countries, over 44,000 patients, um, and 500 cases being shared per week through the Matchmaker Exchange uh, for the purposes of novel gene discovery. So these are uh, mostly undiagnosed cases that are trying to find other similar cases anywhere in the world. Uh, so the, in terms of options for finding out more um, or, or starting to use these tools, um, so phenotypes.org is the, the website for the open source uh, core of phenotypes. Um, you can uh, try it out. So there is a playground instance that you can interact with uh, that is live on the web. You should not use it for real data. Uh, because everything is open, <laughs> completely open. But if you want to you know, get a feel for it, you can use that. You can also download it locally um, and set it up either on your computer or on a server at your institution. Uh, and you can view the source code and modify the source code. Um, and that is all available on GitHub. In terms of Gene42, so I am here um, in my capacity at Gene42, uh, we help organizations use phenotypes. Um, we often work with uh, hospitals or research institutes or pharmaceutical companies uh, to set them up with phenotypes. We will license it to them if they need to integrate it into their existing systems. Um, we will do the deployment and manage that and upgrades, bug fixes. We provide support for their users using it and training. Uh, and we do customizations and modifications, uh, build out new functionality to the software for them. As part of the biohackathon that we will be going to tomorrow, uh, which I am very excited to, to get to go to and to visit uh, Matsue, which I have never been to, but sounds beautiful. Um, one of the, the, the main project that I will be working on there uh, is connecting 
phenotypes to PubCase Finder, um, as, as Fujiwara-san showed earlier. Uh, being able to search within uh, PubCase Finder, uh, record patients within phenotypes, ideally both of these two systems using the Japanese HPO. Um, that has been, I know that PubCase Finder uses it, but in phenotypes we do not yet. Uh, and then to be able to have PubCase Finder find cases in phenotypes and phenotypes find diagnoses through PubCase Finder. Also, if anyone is interested, the, the translation effort uh, is currently on Crowdin, which is the same platform that the human phenotype ontology uses uh, for translation. Uh, there is a Japanese project there that is uh, at its infancy. Um, and so if anyone uh, is interested or knows anyone who would be interested in helping translate that, uh, please let me know. Uh, I think we will be working on, hopefully working on some of that over the coming weeks as well. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having me and for your attention. Domo, domo arigato gozaimasu.